So, why have I brought you to this wall to tell you about the very beginning of the Highland Clearances when this wall is in Dumfries and Galloway? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story. If you've watched this channel or taken any interest in Scottish history, then you'll have heard about the clearances. Today, I've brought you to the very place that they began. But it's probably not the place you expected. It probably won't be the time that you expected. And I'm guessing not the people you expected either. I've brought you to the National Trust for Scotland's Thieve Gardens and Estate. In 1707, Scotland was subsumed into England. Now, stop it. Before you two start banging on, let's just accept it was 300 years ago, there have been winners and losers, you both have different opinions and you desperately want to argue the toss, but this is not the place. I raise the issue because changes bring challenges and opportunities, and in the 1720s, this estate was part of that. One of the opportunities that some Scots found attractive in this new union was free movement of goods and services and trade, which is significant to this story. You see, if you reared cattle, then the new market to the south meant that it felt like a bonanza. Everyone changed their name to horse and wore a funny hat. The point is that if you were a landholder, you'd been used to getting your rental income in kind. Every time the rents came in, you had to go down to the bank with a big bag of grain, some milk and some cheese and ask the cashier if they got change for two goats, a chicken and a pig. Now there were better opportunities to sell cattle across the border for cash. Some folks were saying you should even get into Bitcoin. The opportunity is too good to miss. If you don't move now, you'll miss the boat. Now somebody had already been taking that boat a hop from here across the Irish Sea. By 1627, the Murrays of Broughton had acquired 65,000 acres of plantation land in Donegal. Now, if you're not sure about the Irish plantations, then one of my three videos on the ethnic cleanse in the James VI talks about that. Anyway, the Scottish Privy Council had given permission for cattle from Donegal to be landed and driven through Galloway for export to England. When the English later banned the import of Irish cattle, this Galloway trade to England became very profitable. And Sir David Dunbar of Baldoon was one of the Episcopalian Stuart loyalists who profited and brought up neighbouring land from a McClellan Lord of Kirkubri who'd bankrupted himself in his support for Covenanters in the 1640s. So irrespective of the political triggers of our time, this whole affair is steeped in the economics and the politics of their time. Now the stats that I've seen suggest that at the start of the 18th century, before this UK thing existed, 30,000 cattle crossed the border to England each year. Halfway through the century, that had risen to 80,000, and by the end of the century, 100,000. Perfectly placed to exploit this demand were the landowners in Galloway. But to exploit your land and the, your cattle, you'd want your cattle protected. You don't want them roaming off and mixing with the beasts of the common folk. They started enclosing the land with walls and evicting common tenants. So the clear in the Scottish people that we all perceive to be about making way for sheep in the highlands actually started to make way for cattle in the lowlands. The common solution to these problems was, of course, emigration. But loads of folk didn't have the money to become economic migrants. We've got descriptions of evicted tenants huddled along the sides of dikes in winter to shelter from the wind and the chill because they had nowhere else to go. There are reports of people served with eviction found hanged in their houses rather than face that harsh ignominy. And it made me wonder about the connection between these lowly agricultural workers and those who threw themselves off the Empire State Building at the Wall Street crash. I mean, you strip away the ephemeral trappings of wealth and superficial frippery. Is the drop less dramatic? 
The fall that takes place inside your head is probably pretty similar. So what makes it so easy for one group to dismiss the pain of another? Of course, there were many landowners and gentry who did dismiss the pain and suffering of those that were cast out. And there were those agricultural workers in what had been a strong covenant in the area who'd suffered under crown and nobility and had no sympathy with certain landowners. In these rural communities, the annual summer fair brought people together to gossip, exchange news, plan for the year to come, to act as a community. And at the annual summer fair, at Kelton Hill in May 1723, that is exactly what happened. 500 families were to be evicted from Wigtonshire in the Glen Kens and replaced by cattle. In the hustle and bustle of bodies and voices, oiled by the lubricants often found at these social gatherings, somebody suggested that they should start levelling these dikes. Somebody else said that was a great idea. Quite right, said a third. And yet nobody did anything until the start of 1724. Now, I think Dumfries and Galloway is a beautiful part of Scotland that tourists tend to neglect. I'd be keen to know in the comments section if you've visited and what is your favourite part of Scotland. Anyway, back to the story. Often, revolutions don't start with the people at the very bottom. And two men, one a former tenant of Gordon of Earlston and the other, Lady Ken Muirs, met at a local inn. They were being asked to take on additional tenants put off other lands for cattle. And frankly, they'd had enough. They signed a bond committing each other to resist the spread of dikes. And then more people joined in to sign the secret bond. When they had enough, they began going out at night and beginning with the landlords mentioned, started breaking down the enclosing walls. More joined the clandestine task of midnight wall breaking and then even more came and they had joined the cause until they had the confidence to break down walls in daylight. Galloway was awash with levellers. These levellers became more organised under the leadership of a guy called Billy Marshall, who for some reason became known as King of the Galloway Gypsies. Landowners, recognising the risk to their position, called for military intervention under the leadership of James Stuart Lord Gairlies, known as the Fifth Earl of Galloway. Are you picking a side? In the rising violence that followed, one report spoke of how a mob of levellers were pursued by a group of mounted gentlemen who had taken muskets to protect themselves against the pitchfork brandishing mob. Have you ever noticed how a mob being pursued by a group of gentlemen doesn't sound nearly as bad as a group of gentlemen being pursued by a mob? And yet the gentlemen have guns and the levellers only pitchforks. A gentleman with a gun threatens nobody, but a field worker with a pitchfork can bring down the state. The levellers were seeking to protect their way of life, their food supply, their means of survival. Justifications that might cause a state to declare war and ask that very evicted farmer to rally to the flag. And I don't care what flag you're talking about, in some ways that's the theme of this video. It's easy to forget that for the preceding few generations, this area had been steeped in Covenanton and Whigs versus Tories and Jacobites versus Hanoverians. The very word Whig was coined because of people from this area marching against the Stuart Crown. Often in the level uprisings, when government authorities read the Riot Act, it would be countered by the levellers reading extracts from the Solemn League and Covenant. Whether you took the side of the improvers or the levellers might be as much about a mess of political and emotional triggers than it was about real life economic or policy issues. And so we come to the wall, 
At the height of these land wars, class wars, agricultural disputes of 1724, a group of levellers approached what's now the Thrieve Estate run by the National Trust for Scotland, but what was at the time owned by Captain Robert Johnson, businessman, merchant, landowner and local provost who lived in here. Now the story goes that as the levellers approached, they were met by the local minister, the Reverend William Faulkner, along with the laird Robert Johnson. Now, depending on which story you believe, either the minister set forth powerful oratory asking the levellers to leave the wall intact. Now that's possible. Certainly, in May 1724, the Presbytery of Kirkcubri issued a declaration condemning the destruction of the dikes as against the institution of heaven and contrary to the will of God. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland pronounced against the levellers and like in the Highland clearances to come, many ministers would preach on the side of the landowners. But some ministers preached against the erection of dikes in the first place. Indeed, Reverend Faulkner, who we mentioned, was arrested in July 1724 and imprisoned in Edinburgh for unlawfully convocating with other accomplices who demolished enclosures and continuing in a riotous manner after the riot act had been read. So maybe, rather than Reverend Faulkner's preaching, it was the fact that Captain Robert Johnson promised the wall wasn't there to enclose, but to protect his fields from the road. Nobody had been evicted, and nobody would be evicted, that everyone would keep their house, garden, and quantity of corn. Then he produced a barrel of beer and some cheese sandwiches to keep the crowd happy. Maybe that's what saved the wall. Or was it that Robert Johnson had sold his soul to Satan at the crossroads in return for the gift of blues music, and after an impromptu concert, the crowd dispersed. I know which one I believe. Whatever the reason, this was an unusual truce in what had become a violent confrontation. Three miles west of Kirkcubri here is Bonnie Moor. Now, in an attempt to conciliate, landowners and levellers arranged a meeting there. But after some time waiting, the landowners didn't turn up. That wasn't very gentlemanly. What was even less gentlemanly was the reason for their non-appearance. The troops were coming. By June, six troops of dragoons were stationed in this area. This turned the tide. As summer faded to autumn and troops of the Hanoverian government harried levellers across Galloway, they must have been reminded of how troops of the Stuart government harried their covenant and grandparents. Their last stand came in October at Dachray, not far north of Thrieve. 200 levellers were taken prisoner, including Billy Marshall, the king of the Galloway gypsies. Although he escaped on his way back to the toll booth here in Kirkcubri, the flame of the leveller uprising was flickering and would soon be extinguished. Those that found themselves here in the toll booth and charges had little chance of acquittal. Who dispensed justice but the very landowners that they had opposed? Who were the legal prosecutors but these men and their advocates who were advocates in more than name? Advocates for the defence? In the calm after the tempest, what solicitor would defend the wind against accusation? What the Galloway levellers did achieve was a more subtle, gradualist approach to clearance and change, at least in the lowlands. The scary thing about subtle, gradualist change imposed by the gentry is that it could be happening right now and you might not even notice. I've got more videos in the stories of clearance and there's one coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Dochus can be Lama Alive. Cheerio and Rasta.